Awesome. All right, good morning. I see the Zoom room is filling up. It must be nine o'clock, Happy Valley time, which means it's time for the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Today, we are talking with Lindy Miles. She's a postdoctoral research fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She's also the president of the New York City chapter. We look forward to sharing her story in just a minute or two with you. Let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from. Go ahead and drop that information in the chat on the bottom of your Zoom video window. Or if you are joining us on Facebook Live, welcome. You can drop that information in the chat. Let us know who you are and where you're Zooming in from today. We look forward to our conversation, which will get started in just a minute or two. Thanks for joining us this morning on the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I see Carrie Manis from South Orange, New Jersey. Good to see you. And Dave Lucas tuning in from Old Forge, Pennsylvania, the pizza capital of the world. Cheryl, Cheryl Harrison tuning in from State College and Michael Rosenblatt on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Welcome into coffee hour. Good to have so many people joining us. Greg Walker in Northampton, Massachusetts. Also joining us today. Today, we have a great guest lined up. Lindy Miles joins us. She, I'm sorry, Dr. Lindy Miles joins us today. She's a postdoctoral research fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and is the president of the Penn State Alumni Association's New York City chapter. We're going to talk to her about her career, about her service to Penn State, uh, and about her Penn State journey, which is uh, a little unusual. I look forward to sharing that. Uh, oh, we have uh, Lindsay's parents are also joining us. Lisa Miles down in KDH in uh, the Outer Banks. Good to see you all tuning in from Kill Devil Hills. We'll be down there a little bit later this summer with, with my family. I always enjoy our trips to the Outer Banks, but glad you're able to tune in to Coffee Hour. Proud parents tuning in for Lindsay Ma Lindy Miles today. Where else would you rather be than a Zoom full of Penn Staters? I'm Paul Clifford, CEO of the Penn State Alumni Association, and welcome to the Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. Each week on Coffee Hour, you can expect to hear the voices of Penn Staters talking about what they're passionate about, and you can expect to feel the pride and the power of the Penn State Network. As always, as always, we are recording this session, and closed captions are available for this event. You can find the information in the chat in Zoom or in the comments on Facebook Live. Dr. Lindsay Miles graduated from Penn State in 2009 with a bachelor's degree in biochemistry and molecular biology and went on to receive her PhD in pharmacology and molecular, molecular sciences from the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine in 2016. Lindy is currently a postdoctoral research fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center studying clonal evolution and acute myeloid leukemia. During her tenure as a postdoctoral fellow, Lindy has been awarded multiple fellowships to support her work and publish research articles in top tier scientific journals. Lindy has also been involved in, in her spare time uh, with the New York City chapter of the Penn State Alumni Association, serving that group since 2015 and serving as their president since 2018. I'm excited to welcome a, a great volunteer, a public servant, and, and my friend Lindsay Miles to Coffee Hour. Lindsay, good morning. How are you? Good morning, Paul. It's great to see you. It's great to see you. So let's let's start. Are you a coffee or a tea person? How do you wake up in the morning? Definitely coffee. Yeah. Always in my Penn State mug, of course. So 
That's awesome. Great uh, brand placement there to start off coffee hour. Always appreciate that. Uh, so it's a little rare that a student has a professional career before they come to Penn State, but that's exactly what the case was for you. Can you share a little bit about your career before you came to Penn State? Sure. Um, so I actually started uh, dancing when I was three years old. Um, I did mostly ballet, uh, classical ballet. Um, and I think around the age of 10 or probably even earlier, um, my parents can, can probably chime in in the chat when I said this first, but I was set on being a professional dancer for my entire life. Um, and so I graduated high school um, early to, to start my career um, and uh, went to North Carolina and was a professional um, ballet dancer down there. Um, sadly, it was very short lived. Um, I got an injury um, within the first year that I was dancing down there and um, came back home and, uh, you know, decided on, on a plan B, which had always been, an, you know, a, a, a love of mine, um, but going to, uh, going to college and, and becoming a scientist. So. And so how did you decide that Penn State would be the college for you? So I had actually, um, you know, my, my parents and my sister, my younger sister, all ended up going to Juniata College, uh, which is really close to Huntington, Pennsylvania, where I grew up. Um, but I was kind of, you know, I, I wanted a, a bigger school feel um, and had always been up at Penn State. And, you know, when I was um, dancing, I actually um, had registered for um, online classes, which Penn State was one of the earliest uh, universities to offer online uh, classes. Um, and so when I came home, um, you know, I had the, the choice to either go straight to Penn State campus or to look around at other colleges. And I was like, nope, I, I stepped on campus and, and I was like, this is home. So, so um, you came home to Penn State. What were you involved in as a student? Um, so I uh, was really involved in undergraduate research, um, pretty much starting right off the bat. I had um, a wonderful mentor, um, uh, Dr. Marty Bollinger, um, who I worked with for three and a half years. Um, so I started right after my um, first semester working with him. Um, and, you know, I was um, really involved in kind of all aspects of, of doing research and, and helping um, you know, train other undergraduates um, towards my towards my senior year. Also, was um, helped with you know friends with Thon. I wasn't directly involved, but um, was always there um, at Thon, uh, cheering people on. So, what are some of your favorite memories uh, from your time at Penn State? You know, you grew up here, not too far from from campus, about uh, an hour or so, maybe a little bit more down the road, right? So, you were already familiar with. Penn State and, and some of the traditions. What were some of your favorite memories from your time here as a student? Um, you know, I, you know, I don't actually remember going to a Penn State football game. Again, my parents might be able to correct this, but I don't remember going to a game until I was a student. And um, stepping foot in Beaver Stadium as a student was hands down multiple of my favorite memories uh, were um, you know, involved football and, and the, um, and campus. But, you know, I, I think some of my biggest memories are just, you know, hanging out with friends on the, on the hub lawn, um, and, you know, really being able to, to just experience, um, experience everything there is about Penn State and everyone's pride with Penn State. Um, yeah. So I think, you know, it's, it's kind of all encompassing. Those, those four years were, were four of the best of my life for sure. So um, it's hard to pick one. It's interesting you bring up Beaver Stadium. That's, uh, uh, I've talked about this before. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the building when, when it's packed, right, is, yeah. is a very overwhelming place. It's, it's uh, I know I have, I've welled up on occasion just from, I don't know whether it's the excitement or the energy of the building, but um, I'm thinking back to like my first time as a kid uh, thinking, wow, this place is, this place is something else. Uh, you're getting a little bit chirped at in the chat. You're, I think it's your dad wants to know what about wrestling? Absolutely. Uh, so my dad was a, a high school wrestling coach. So I grew up on the mat. I consider yeah. myself a mat brat. 
Um, and I, you know, I've watched wrestling with my dad ever since I could remember. Um, and we've absolutely loved watching Penn State grow to the dynasty that it is right now. Um, and, you know, we uh, were supposed to go to our first uh, NCAAs last year, right before they got, um, they got canceled. So hoping that we can go, you know, as soon as we're allowed. Um, but yeah, I mean, wrestling is another, um, you know, being able to one, be in rec hall and feeling right. that energy there, but then going to the Bryce Jordan Center and feeling like so much more energy. Um, yeah. So awesome. Yeah, I, absolutely. First of all, I'm shocked that you didn't go to the NCAAs when they were in New York City. I, that we sounds did. like So oh, we, okay. we went there, um, but our first traveling one, I should say. Oh, your first, your first yep. traveling one. Okay, yeah. I get that. You were there. Now, let, let's be honest. Your dad is a little bit more than just a wrestling coach. Uh, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, your dad's a Hall of Fame wrestling coach and has had an amazing uh, high school coaching career. And so uh, let's not let's not undersell uh, his accomplishments. No, nope. yeah, he was a Hall of Famer for both an athlete and a coach. So you know he's he's very much one of my one of my um, superheroes. Absolutely. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined today by Dr. Lin Lindy Miles. Uh, she is a postdoctoral research fellow at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and the president of our New York City chapter. Well, we're going to get to talking about the chapter in just a couple minutes, but I want to dive into your professional life, which has thus far uh, been committed to the study of cancer, specifically uh, early on small cell lung cancer and now leukemia. This work is, is deeply personal for you. You lost your grandfather to small cell lung cancer. Talk about your interest in this research. Yeah, um, I mean, I've, I've always been um, interested in how things tick um, and, you know, kind of um, what, um, you know, how to kind of take something apart and, and figure out what really keeps it working. Um, and with cancer, you know, I think there's so many, there's so many different types of cancer um, and finding the way, you know, figuring out how cancer evolves and, and develops um, and figuring out how we can take that apart and, um, and help, you know, um, peop and help patients is kind of, you know, kind of how I got started um, in it. You know, I, um, small cell, of course, be being that my, both my grandfather, as well as Joe Pa, who is, you know, a big um, piece of my life, uh, you know, was, um, it was really important for me to really understand how small cell lung cancer worked and, and if I could help combat it um, in, in some way, shape or form, so. Oh, I lost, I think you muted yourself. I did, sorry. You talked about, oh, God, that's a rookie error. I've been doing it for a lot, 50 episodes now and I'm still having to come off mute. Sorry about that. That's okay. You, you know, you talked about, um, always having an interest in learning what makes things tick, right? Yeah. When you were a kid, what lit the fire for science and the pursuit of STEM? It seems like, you know, you, you describe being a professionally trained dancer and then being also interested in, in the STEM and STEM and the sciences, like it's two competing forces within your right, left brain, right brain kind of thing going on. Talk about what lit that fire for the sciences for you. Sure. Um, it's my, it was my parents hands down. So my dad was a, a sixth grade science teacher when I was growing up and my mom was a pharmaceutical sales rep uh, for Merck. And so, you know, my dad, we had a microscope at home, you know, we were always doing experiments. Um, and, you know, I'm sure I annoyed the crap out of them asking, well, why this, why does this happen? You know, what does this mean? Um, and they never, they never got annoyed with, you know, those questions and tried to answer them or, or, you know, inspired me to go figure it out on my own and do an experiment. Um, you know, and so growing up, science was always a huge part of, of my life at home and, and, um, something that I just, I loved doing in school. Um, I also had a really awesome high school chemistry teacher. Um, who 
I, he called me his dancing chemist. He said, if you ever, you know, stop dancing, you're going to go into the sciences. I know it. And, and he was totally right. Um, so Mr. Long, that, you know, rings true. Um, so yeah, so I, he, you know, I just, I've had really awesome people that have been involved in STEM and, and have STEM careers that just really kind of helped inspire me to stay on that track. Well, it sounds like it's a little bit of the family business, right? With your dad, you know, being the athlete on one side and, and the scientist on the other, you know, he could explain, you know, the technique of a, of a wizard or a Merkel yeah. or the, the sweep single, right? Yeah. Uh, as, as much as he can describe uh, the technical aspects of being a science teacher in, in the classroom to students and helping them kind of grasp and light that fire for, for science with his students. Uh, how have you kind of taken that example and, and turned it around? You know, you, you are um, a role model to, to so many. How have you made that part of your work to reach out to children and to introduce them and get them excited about the STEM sciences? Yeah, I mean, here at, Penn, uh, at MSK, you know, we do a lot of outreach um, to schools here. Um, and we always have, you know, high school students. I, I actually have worked with a high school student now for, I think, almost four years. She's now at Duke um, doing uh, biomedical engineering. Um, and I've worked with her since she was a freshman in high school. And, you know, I think having opportunities like that to work in the lab and really see how fun science is, um, is super important. And I've um, done that with a few uh, students here as much, you know, as much as I can um, bring them into the lab. I've also, um, and this is kind of a, you know, I'm willing to do this really for anyone. I've, with, when my sister was teaching, um, I actually went to her classroom and did kind of a, like a walkthrough of like what it is to be a scientist. And um, the kids are so, excited to learn new things. And I think that half of um, inspiring them is, is continuing to light the fire for that excitement and, and um, help them uh, find ways that they can get involved in STEM. And I know Penn State does a ton of outreach um, as you know, from the Eberly College of Science in terms of um, STEM camps and, and you know, STEM days where they go into the schools and do a lot of outreach there. And so, um, you know, if, if kids are, are excited about STEM, I think getting them involved um, and keeping them involved is, is super important. So, You know, it, it, it strikes me that the, the curriculum that you followed at Penn State, right, gave you a really solid preparation in, in the basic sciences, right, to go to Johns Hopkins later to pursue your PhD. But as, as I was kind of doing my research on you, a lot of your work also seems to be split between lab time and then describing what you're doing in the lab, right? Maybe not the basic science, but, but kind of the technical writing and, and having to sell the work that you're doing. Talk a little bit about the, the grant applications that, uh, and, and those processes to, that are really critical in funding the research that you're doing. Yeah, and I mean, you know, we aren't able to do what we do without one philanthropic um, money that comes through grants um, like Cycle for Survival. Fawn is a, is a perfect example. You know, um, all of that philanthropic money then um, becomes grant awards that that uh, we can win. Um, and being able to explain, you know, it it takes a lot of practice to be able to explain your research. Um, one to an audience that that may not be um, really in the weeds when it comes to understanding leukemia or lung cancer, but sometimes you also have to explain it to people that don't have really any science background either and their financial advisors or teachers. And so it's um, being able to navigate that and know exactly what level of depth you have to go into is, is important. I've had awesome mentors that have helped me with, um, with a lot of that, but, um, you know, it's, it, the biggest thing I think is making people, uh, you know, believe in your science, bet on your science, um, and understand why it's so important to continue to do that research. And, and it's similar to trying to get someone to invest in your company. Um, you know, really explaining, 
like why it's so important that that this research get done and um, that I'm the best person that's going to be able to to get it done. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I think of the work that you're doing and there's really two sides of, of, of writing, right? There's the, here's what I think I can do and hope that you'll fund it. Yep. And then on the other side of that, it's here's what I've learned from the research I've done and, and how it's going to potentially help other people. Uh, mm -hmm. Erica actually has a question about um, your publications, which have been numerous. Uh, she mentions that you were recently published as the lead author on a study. Congratulations, she says. Um, is more work required to be a lead author or is it more, more so a sign of status within the research facility? What does it mean to be a lead author on a research study? So lead author um, on a research study means that you did the vast majority of the work. Um, so uh, it has, you know, thankfully nothing to do with your status at the, at the institution. Um, you know, because I'm a, a mere postdoc with PIs here that have been here for 50, you know, years. Um, and so, you know, but this research was was my baby. Um, my and another um, postdoc in the lab, Bobby, were actually co-lead authors on the paper. Um, and, you know, it was kind of our, our project. Um, and we kind of, thankfully, with our um, awesome mentor and um, PI, principal investigator, Ross um, got to kind of run this and and um, let it kind of guide what story we told, um, which was you know I think really um, really an awesome learning opportunity for us um, and really exciting in terms of um, getting to see kind of the impact that this work would have. I think you know we didn't expect it to to be as big of a paper as as we. Um, as it was when we started the work. Um, so it was really cool to see it kind of, uh, to kind of form into this. Yeah, can you talk, so you, you mentioned a couple of things in my mind is now racing in a couple of different <coughs> directions here. Um, can you talk about what it means to be a post doctoral research fellow? <coughs> Excuse me. And um, how that might be different than kind of what we might be thinking of the the first kind of independent kind of job experience in the field that you're in? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I, the way that I kind of have, ex, you know, always explained it is, um, you know, you go to grad school, you get your PhD, and then you kind of go through a second grad school that is, there's no classes um, and you get to be more independent, but you're still, you're still learning and you're still a trainee. Um, and it's really about learning how to um, take a question that you want to ask and formulate an entire project around it, get it funded, um, get it published, um, but also learn how to manage people um, and how to interact with people. And I think um, that, you know, that's a big part of running your own lab that um, you don't learn in grad school. And I think kind of having this um, second grad school uh, is kind of a way to a way to learn that it, you know we usually get paired with uh, mentees that that kind of work with us um, either graduate students medical students or you know kind of summer interns um, and we learn how to kind of um, we learn how to manage and lead a team um, and I think that's kind of one of the more important things to learn um, in a postdoc uh, position but you know, it's it's not a it's not a, a completely independent position yet. Um, and so, um, after your postdoc, when you apply for you know your first um, principal investigator position, um, that's kind of when the you know the real uh, adult world starts. <laughs> I, absolutely, and I, and I think that you know it's important to understand that the uh, environment that you're in right now is is a continuation of your education. And that your PI in a lot of ways is, is your mentor and, and kind of your teacher along the way. And from what I understand, you know, your PI, uh, it's, been a, it's been a really special situation for you in that I think some PIs are more hands-on and directive of the, of the research that's being conducted. But it, from what I've been able to learn, the PIs that you have worked with have really allowed you to be independent, to um, to make mistakes, to learn from mistakes, uh, and kind of this truly kind of educational environment. Talk about the importance of that 
mentor mentee relationship? It's, uh, you know, there, I don't know if there any, is anything that's more important um, in, in the sciences. You know, I, I mean, I think um, you're going to learn how to become a scientist. Um, and, but I, I honestly think that if I hadn't have had the mentors that I um, had, I wouldn't be where I am today. And that, that starts with um, Marty at, at Penn State, um, who's still there. Um, he and I still text to this day. He's helped me, you know, um, with writing letters for me and, and reading stuff that I've written. Um, I worked with a grad student, Megan Matthews, who's now a professor at Penn, um, and her and I still talk. You know, I think um, that having that type of relationship and being able to, one, fully trust them that they have your best interest at heart um, and that you can really go to them with anything um, and and get their feedback and, and their honest feedback. You know, sometimes um, you you know, there needs to be honesty there. And, and you know, they're going to probably say things sometimes that you don't want to hear, but um, it's important to hear those things. And I, I think that, um, you know, and then here at MSK, starting at Hopkins with Charlie, my mentor, and now Ross, um, the both of them, you know, I think um, there's trust coming the other way too. You know, they trust that I'm not going to go off, you know, go down a rabbit hole on a project. And if I start to, they kind of, nudge me back, you know, um, but I think that that continues once I leave the lab too, you know, I still kind of talk to both Charlie and Ross, you know, about what I want to do when I'm running my own lab. And they're like, well, you want to make sure, you know, this sounds good. This one, you know, might want to shy away from for right now, you know, and I think that that's, it's still a learning experience, you know, and I think, um, but having that level of trust and honesty um, and communication is super important. And it doesn't help that, or it doesn't hurt that, um, you know, I, um, they're all great people too. And, you know, so I, I consider them close friends as well as mentors, um, which I think is important in, in keeping that connection. So you're a self-described tinkerer, right? Break down your research for us. How are you attacking the problem that you're trying to solve? Are you looking for a preventative solution so that this cancer never occurs again? Or are you looking for ways to defeat it after it occurs? Sure, yeah, so um, the work that I currently do um, on uh, acute myeloid leukemia um, is looking at how that leukemia evolves. So um, cells pick up, so leukemia is a, a blood cancer. So the um, cancer usually starts in your bone marrow. Um, and so a cell, a wild type normal cell will pick up usually one mutation and then another and then another, which leads to kind of a breakdown of their normal function and gives them either new functions or um, uh, functions that they don't respond like they typically should as a normal cell. Um, but understanding kind of what each one of those mutations does is very important because it might affect kind of how that um, leukemia responds to therapy, what therapies it responds to, um, and kind of being able to look at every single step um, in that development of leukemia um, is, is my research. So kind of asking what happens when it picks up that first mutation, what changes within that cell, um, and then how does that cell pick up the next mutation? Um, and how many of those mutations is really needed for a cell to say, like, now I'm ready to kind of be a full-blown leukemia. Um, and, and then, like I said, pulling that apart and saying, okay, now we're at a full leukemia. Um, we know kind of the steps it went through. How can we stop it before it gets to leukemia? Um, and what is that cell now uniquely sensitive to that we can um, hijack as a, as a therapeutic strategy? Excellent. So I imagine in the work that you do, you have tons of free time, right, to give, to give back to Penn State. And then I hope people are picking up on my, my sarcasm. I know the, the work that you do is pretty intense, but somehow you find time to give back to your alma mater through your service in the Penn State Alumni Association's New York City chapter. First, talk about what it was like to move to New York 
and how important the chapter was in helping with that transition? Um, you know, New York is a beast. I mean, it's um, it's a huge place. And I, I think you, you know, visiting New York, which I did a lot, um, you're kind of in this like, oh my gosh, you know, and you, you're always looking up at the tall buildings and, and kind of just feeling like this like small little ant. That still happens when you move here. Um, and, you know, I think I initially was very overwhelmed by how big and how many people um, lived here. And, you know, I remember talking to a friend and being like, you know, I barely have friends here. Um, you know, I, I really don't know anyone. It's, it's hard to like sit down at, you know, a bar or restaurant and start talking to the person next to you. Like, and he was like, well, aren't you like a Penn Stater? Like, don't you have Penn State chapters all over the place? And um, I was like, oh, that's a really good idea. Why didn't I think of that? And, and so I went to a, a New York City chapter event um, and the immediate feeling of walking into a place knowing that you have a connection with almost everyone that's there is so nice in a, such a big place like New York. Um, it makes New York feel like a much smaller city because I have a family here and I have a friend group and a network here. Um, and so honestly, I think, I don't know if I would have stayed in New York City for as long as I did if I was not involved um, in the chapter in some way, just because of how, um, how manageable it made living in New York City. Absolutely, it, it gave you that sense of home which yep. I assume is what inspired you to get further involved. And so um, you, you joined the chapter officially in 2015 as a, uh, on their board. Talk a little bit about your progression uh, through the leadership uh, post that you've held with the chapter. Sure. Um, so I started as the philanthropy director. Um, so I was involved in scholarship fundraising, um, which our scholarship um, goes to New York City residents that are coming to Penn State. Um, and, you know, that kind of, I loved doing that position because, you know, I one got to interact with um, students. Actually, one of our uh, scholarship awardees is now on our board. Um, she graduated and came back and got involved, which is awesome. Um, and, you know, being able to see that come full circle is hands down some of the best, you know, pieces of being involved in the, in the chapter. Um, and then, you know, I, um, was always up for a challenge. So, you know, when a position opened up on the exec board, um, I stepped into the secretary role um, and I did that for a year um, and then stepped on to, you know, stepped up to being president um, in 2018, um, which has been, you know, one of the most challenging and rewarding positions um, that I've, you know, been able to be a part of, so. Well, absolutely. You took the reins from, um... Well, I'm, I'm thinking back to Lynn Hendrickson, uh, who was uh, just a phenomenal leader for us and have really advanced the ball down the field in New York City. I can brag about you all day, but why don't you brag a little bit about your chapter and talk about some of your signature programs and, and initiatives that you have for New York City alumni? Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I love being able to brag about my chapter one. I have to give a shout out to my team and my board because they, I would not be able to do this without them. This is definitely takes a village. It takes a team and I have one of the best. Um, and I, you know, I am thankful every day for all the all-stars that I have on my team. Um, you know, we have two really awesome events coming up that we've been working um, pretty much since last year on. One is our annual meeting. Um, our annual celebration. Um, we're hosting, it's virtual, but we're hosting Kale Sanderson, which I'm super excited about being a you know, big wrestling fan. Um, and so that should be awesome. And it, it's kind of our kind of wrap up for the year um, and being able to tell kind of what all we've done, what we're hoping to do. Um, we also have a golf tournament that um, is coming up um, June 25th. Um, and we're really looking forward to that. Um, you know, that has been a, a big scholarship fundraiser and we right now have a sale um, uh, going on for pricing. So if you're interested, make sure you join. Um, but, and lastly, we actually started a podcast um, this uh, January where we're actually uh, interviewing um, New York City Penn Staters um, from all different colleges. Our, our first kind of season is, is one person from every college. So 
Um, and that's been really awesome. It's, you know, so very similar to this where you kind of just get to hear about some really awesome stories um, and how, you know, Penn State has helped um, kind of fuel their careers. And um, we're getting to meet a lot of Penn Staters that, you know, either were somewhat involved in the chapter, but are getting more involved um, and, um, or ones that didn't know that there was a chapter, you know, in New York until we reached out to them and are now, now involved as well. So um, those are kind of the three kind of big things that we have going on right now. And we're really excited for, uh, for all of them. Absolutely. A lot of great and exciting things going on. If you are a consumer of podcasts, go ahead and check out the PSU Big Apple podcast. You can download that on your podcast app of choice and hear about all the great stories of, of New York City Penn State alumni uh, and, and that brand new podcast by the New York City chapter. So go ahead and subscribe to that today. Lindy, how can people get more information about the chapter and, uh, and, and all the great things that you're doing? Sure. Um, so our website is psunyc.org, um, which has all of our events, all of our news. Um, we send out a weekly newsletter, um, so you can sign up for that. It's totally free. You don't have to be a member. Um, and that kind of gives kind of the, the round out of, of what we're, you know, is on our calendar, what's coming up, um, you know, and, you know, kind of lets everyone know what we're, what we're working on. So that's after, the best way. After the year we've had, how good is it to talk about a face-to-face -face golf tournament? Oh my gosh. Um, we've been waiting so long to be able to do that. Um, you know, and, and social distancing will still be in place and, and we're, um, keeping with COVID precautions, but, um, it's, it's so nice to kind of start to see things, uh, slowly opening back up and, we're really excited to start hosting in person. You know, it's, um, I've always said like, you know, I'm slightly an introvert, but after this year, I was like, oh no, I'm totally an extrovert. I need right. to be around people. <laughs> so um, I'm very much looking forward to, to in-person events. This is the Penn State Alumni Association's Coffee Hour. I'm Paul Clifford. I'm joined this morning by Lindy Miles. She is a postdoctoral fellow. Uh, at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, and she's the president of our New York City chapter. All right, we like to have a little bit of fun here on, uh, on Coffee Hour. Um, I'm going to ask you a few quick hitter questions. You just answer the first thing that pops to mind. Um, I'm just looking in the chat. Dave Lucas is asking a question. When can Penn State Scranton Alumni Society uh, come out to see you guys in New York City? Anytime, as soon as we're allowed. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, you know, some of the great, um, some of the great Penn State activities uh, that I that I think of in, in my time here at Penn State have been in New York City. When I think of hoops and hockey yeah. back in 2016, or um, the NIT, uh, when we played in the NIT, we've played hockey in New York City, I think since then, I think we've played basketball there at the Barclays Center. So it's always great when we travel to New York City because it's like a home away from home. Yeah, we love having you guys here. Um, it's, it's always a fun time and we, we try to go all out. All right, your favorite Penn State memory. Ooh, um, okay, I think both are gonna be football games. Um, one during when I was a student was 2008. Um, it was the MSU game and we knew that we were going to the Rose Bowl if we won. Uh -huh. So. Um, everyone brought roses and snuck roses into the game and threw them on the uh, on the field. It was awesome. Um, one as alumni would be the 2016 OSU game, which I'm sure everyone answers. But I was in the end zone where they blocked that kick, and it was the most amazing feeling ever. That's that's fantastic. Um, that was I remember you were sitting with alumni council members yep. that day, and we had the, they had those kind of low level. Uh, which aren't, which aren't fantastic seats, right? I mean, you're, you're right on the field. It's hard to see yeah. things, um, but you were, you were right there for that moment that you'll never oh, forget, yeah. right? So awesome, yeah. How about your favorite class at Penn State? Oh, um, I'm gonna have to give you two again. So first is, uh, was a CAMS class. I think it was CAMS 45, it was classical mythology. Um, I'm a sucker for, you know, for mythology and stories and history. And so it was really cool. It was a really cool class. Um, okay. And then favorite science class was a biology of cancer class. Probably uh, no surprise there, but that was a uh, biology, I think, 416. So. If you could have dinner with anyone, who would it be and why? 
Cool. Um, I'm going to have to go with Joe Pa. You know, I uh -huh. think he has some, um, I think he had some amazing stories and just to kind of hear his ethos uh, and um, hear kind of, you know, I've read a lot of the books that he's written on his coaching strategy and stuff and just being able to talk to him about that and, you know, how he mentored, um, mentored his, you know, his students and student athletes and um, you know, the success with honor was really uh, important to me and still is. And so, um, you know, I um, would love to just kind of chew his ear off with questions. So. All right. You live in the food capital of the world. So I'm going to push you a little bit. And, and Joe, obviously a New York City native growing up in Brooklyn, uh, where would that dinner be? Uh, is there a favorite Italian restaurant that you could take him to now? There's a, it's very, um, it seems very low key, but it has some of the best food that I've had. It's called Tony DiNapoli's. Um, it's actually right here on the Upper East Side. I, it's one of those like plaid covered tables, uh, family style, you know, kind of sharing food. Um, but the food is, is awesome. And I've always had a great experience there. So that's where that's amazing. Lindy and Joe at Tony DiNapoli's. That, yeah. that sounds like a, a conversation I'd like to be a fly on the wall for. So uh, your most unusual we are moment in all of your travels or in maybe just walking around New York City where you heard we are and it caught you off guard. Well, that's a good one. Um, actually, it was in Mexico. So I was in I was in Puerto Vallarta for a friend's wedding um, and I'm always, you know, walking around in a Penn State sweatshirt, especially coming to and from the airport. Um, okay. And so I had literally gotten off the flight. I was. I took two steps out of the airport and someone driving by in a car yelled, we are. Um, and I, you know, had to like look down to make sure that like I was where I was like, are they talking to me? Am I wearing Penn State stuff? And so, you know, screamed, screamed after them Penn State. So that would probably be the best one. All right. This next one is bound to be a controversial answer uh, in the in your household. What is your favorite Penn State sport? Ooh. <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to go wrestling. Okay. Even though okay. I've been to probably to more football games, um, I think I have to go wrestling. It's just, I, it's awesome. <laughs> as you know, part of my job is is politician, right? Yeah. So I my answer to that question is always whatever season we're in. <laughs> That's a good one too. <laughs> yeah. How about your favorite flavor of creamery ice cream? Um, I have a super sweet tooth, so it's gonna be death by chocolate. Death by chocolate. That's also a a great choice. I'm glad it's not tea berry. It seems like there's a tea berry contingent in New York City that I can't quite, I, um, yeah. I can't quite oh, understand. Yeah. <laughs> so, Lindy, thank you so much for joining us on on Coffee Hour. Your work at Memorial Sloan Kettering is is not only changing lives, but it's it's saving lives, uh, and and certainly your work on behalf of your alma mater continues to bring glory back to dear old state. And for that, we're truly grateful. Thanks for joining us on Coffee Hour and allowing us to share your story today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank everyone else who is Zooming in with us this morning. Thank you for joining us. If you're a member of the Penn State Alumni Association, thank you so much for your support. If you're not a member, what are you waiting for? Go to our website at alumni.psu.edu and you too can become a member of the world's largest alumni association. Thanks for all you do for the glory, for the university, and for the future. We are Penn State.